All right, recording. So again, welcome. This is our fourth session. If you have been with us through the entire series, this is our fourth and final session of Excel skills. We started out very easy. We actually, we had Luke Hilko from Silo Transportation came and talked to everybody about why Excel is important if you're going to go get a job. And then in the second session, I'm sorry, after that, we also talked about very basics of Excel. The second session, we looked at some data charting, we looked at data cleansing, we looked at additional formulas. And then in the third session, we went into pivot tables and how to analyze data. And then somewhere between those sessions, we talked about cleansing data and looking at data to see if it was appropriate to use in your analysis or if it needed to be dropped or not. All right, I almost closed the wrong button and I almost closed the whole meeting. Whoops, don't wanna do that. So tonight, final session, we're gonna talk about, I build it as solving a problem in Excel. In reality, I should have called it answering questions in Excel. So solving a problem, we will solve a problem tonight, but many students, many people think about solving a problem using the solver add-in in Excel, which is a wonderful tool a little bit beyond our discussion tonight. Um, what I do plan to do is I plan to send a survey to everyone who has attended one of these four sessions and just find out what was useful for you and what was not useful for you. Because I do these every semester with the exception of last fall due to a scheduling issue. But I do these every semester and I wanna be sure that I'm covering material that students find useful in some manner. So look forward to that survey. I would appreciate if you would respond to it. All right, let's get started. I am going to share my screen, although first I'm gonna be sure I have nothing open here that I don't want to be open, such as you know grades. For some of you who are in my classes, don't wanna display your grade across to 27 students. All right, so let's go with our data set, preferably the correct data set. Let's move this over here and then I can be in a better shape. All right, let's share away, shall we? By the way, I did not introduce myself. If you do not know me, I am Dr. Tarpey. I teach in the Department of Management in our supply chain management program, as well as our healthcare management programs. Um, I'm one of five supply chain professors. I'm one of one healthcare professors. I guess I'm one of one and a half. Dr. Nelson actually teaches one healthcare management class, and then I teach the rest. Um, I have been at MTSU for about three years as a full-time professor. I was an adjunct prior to that. Um, prior to becoming a professor here at MTSU, I worked at HCA for 22 years as vice president of labor management. And prior to that, I won't tell you how many years I worked for United Airlines up in Chicago in their corporate office, which is where I am from originally. So not wasting any more time on me, let's get right to the data set. To say the least, I've done some Excel in my life. All our supply chain classes use Excel and every one of you really should be supply chain majors when you think about it. That's where the jobs are. We had six students hired in the last two weeks out of our, yeah, isn't that great, Heather? <laughs> six students hired out of our recent events we've had with our industry partners, which is phenomenal right now. And we're talking jobs. I think we talked about this in session one. We're not talking jobs that make 20000 a year either. Last student I talked to, he was deciding between a job that pays 68000 a year and a job that pays $65,000 a year. That's a pretty good starting salary for a recent college graduate in Middle Tennessee. May not be such a good salary for New York or California, but that's doing pretty good in Middle Tennessee. Very impressive. All right, so let's see here. I want to share this. And that's ugly, so let's go and share, hopefully, this one. Did I share the right one? Nope, didn't hit the right button. There we go. Now let's go share this one. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, I need to do it over here. All right, let's do this over here. Awesome. And I want to take this one. Well, we'll just go with this one for now. 
All right, this should be the data set that I have sent to you most recently. I believe Danielle had said it was 552 this evening. There are three tabs, the source data tab, which has some products, different categories, different products, different total sales for different quarters. There's a margin tab that has those same categories and products along with the margin and a price, a unit price. And then we have some damages costs. Um, we're gonna delete that because I'm gonna show you how to do that. I think I sent that to you, so I'll, I'll take it. We'll just talk about it since I did send you that. All right, so what do we wanna do? We've got somewhere in the neighborhood of, I don't know, 300 rows, 287 rows of data for different products that are sold by this particular organization. First, we have different categories, different products. If you recall, we can easily see how many categories we have by simply applying the filter button. And if, if you're on, mute your phone, if you would, if you're on, if there's background noise, please. Jose, are you there? Thank you. Awesome. All right. We can apply the filter. Just click in our header row. We go to our filter. This should all be refresher for you. If I hit the drop down menu of category, I can see I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight categories of products from beverages to seafood. Likewise, I can see how many products I have. I would expect I have a lot more products than I do. These are all the products that are sold. I swapped it up a little and I took an organization from, as you can imagine by some of the names, I believe it's Finland is where this came from, which sells a great deal of interesting food from German to Finnish to some American food, as it turns out. And then I've got sales for a particular quarter. So for quarter one, we have sales for quarter two, three, and four. So if I look at Chang, which is a type of tea in this particular case, $228,000 of tea sold in quarter one for that particular product. Pretty simple data set, as is very common when you get data out in the real world, especially when it comes out of ERP systems, which are enterprise resource planning systems. Examples of those systems are SAP, um, Oracle, um, eh, Lawson, not so much. Lawson, if you're in healthcare, um, PeopleSoft used to be a one long time ago that ran a lot of um, HR and general ledger financials. Manufacturing, product wise, the two market leaders are SAP, which is number one, and Oracle, which is number two. And that's a uh, worldwide market share. So chances are, if you go out into the industry and you're in any kind of retail sales or manufacturing, you're gonna come across SAP or Oracle. But what's common in those ERP systems is that when you extract data from them, you typically get data in different tabs. Reason being this data is stored in different tables in a database. You rarely get an export of all the data you want. It's very rare because typically the data you want is not all contained within one table in the ERP system. So there's two ways to go about that. Either when you export your data, you write a SQL statement, which is structured query language, if you're into databases, that basically pulls just the columns you want from all the various tables and creates one export file. That's the best way. Or somebody pulls the data for you and they just get you a bunch of tables. And once you have a bunch of tables, you need to figure out what to do with them. So I, I did the table route today so that we can talk about how we can combine data from different tables. In our case, each table is on a different worksheet. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new worksheet. I think I told you last session we had, um, and this is entirely up to you. My best practice is I never mess with the data I was given. That's my rule, right? Never screw around with the data you were given because if you'd accidentally overtype something, you'll lose it and you have to go get a new extract or you have to re-import your data and that can be somewhat time consuming in some cases. So the first thing I typically do is I'm gonna create a new spreadsheet and I'm gonna call it my analysis spreadsheet. This is where I'm gonna do all my work so I don't mess everything up. So I look at my tables, this is the source data. This is the one I'm going to use. I'm gonna take my data from source data. I'm gonna highlight everything, do a control C to copy. 
go to my analysis table, click in the first cell and do a control V and magically all my data is here. Now this is the, this is gonna be my base table where I'm gonna do all my work. I don't need to do anything else with source data because I've copied everything. But I do need some additional data on here. For instance, I need my margin and my price, right? So margin and price, I need to add to my analysis table. So how are we going to do that? We need to look up our products on the margin table and carry this margin back over to the analysis table. So in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a real simple function called a VLOOKUP. So I'm gonna create a new column here. Let's call it margin. And let's do a VLOOKUP command or a VLOOKUP function. I don't believe I've covered this before. So let's first, Look at what kind of data we have. We have a margin for every product, right? In this case, category is somewhat redundant because the product and category combination is going to be the same. Let's go down to, here we go. Beverages and Chang. Beverages, whoops, beverages and Chang. So we're gonna have the same combination. I don't need to pull that data back here. I've already got this. What I need to do is I need to look for any place here where we have a specific product, I wanna pull the margin for that product over. So for this particular one, we have a 16.91% margin. I wanna have 16.91% margin here for all instances of this product, all four quarters, right? And I wanna be sure that these are, if I right click on my column and do format cells, I want these to be a percentage with two decimal places is fine. But since I entered it as 16.91, when you convert it to percentages, as you know, that's not gonna work. So we need to re-enter these. Oops. All right, so I could go through each one of these, find the next product, 20.19%. I could copy that and say 20. As you can imagine, that would take me quite a while. All right, we don't wanna do that, especially if I had 10,000 rows of data, which I don't have, I cut it back. So that's inefficient. Let's do a formula. In this case, we're gonna do a VLOOKUP formula. If you recall, I told you previously that if you hit the function button up in your formula bar, right to the left of your formula bar, a pop-up comes up that gives you all kinds of information on various functions. Mine happens to be at the top because I've used it recently, but if it's not, you can always type in the function you're looking for and hit go. And it'll return just that one function, hit okay. And it's gonna give you another pop-up box to help you fill in the arguments of that particular function. In this case, a VLOOKUP basically takes a piece of data from your current workbook and goes and looks that up in a corresponding array, I'll talk about that in a minute, and pulls data back. In this case, what we wanna do is we wanna look up this product on this workbook of margin. Let me go back. We wanna look up this product on this workbook, find it in this column. And when we find it, we wanna return this value, right? So let's go through that now step-by-step. Do our VLOOKUP. Okay, the first thing that's being asked for is what do you want to look up? In this case, I want to look up what's in column B. Table array. What's that? What that is asking you is where is your data that you want to cross reference? In this case, I'm going to go over to my margins tab and I want to look up product, I'm going to go ahead and include price as well, but highlight, this is called an array of data. It's basically a table of data that indicates where your matching data is and what data you want to pull back is. In this case, it's on the margins tab, starting in cell B2 and ending in D78. The column index is asking you of this array that you've just described, in this particular box, what column do you want to return? This would be column one, this would be column two, this would be column three. In our case, we want to return the margin, which is column two. 
I want to put a two there. The range lookup, and you see there's hints down here, is a logical value to find the closest match in the first column sorted in ascending order true. If you want an exact match, hit false. In our case, we want an exact match, which is a zero, or you can type in the word false either way. And I get back the 16.91%. So what it has done, what Excel has done is it's taken this value, it's gone across to the table array that I defined in my margins. Let's go to the top here, whoops. Found it right here. And I said, when you find it, give me the second column over from where you found it, counting this first column. So this is column one, column two, and it pulled back the 16.91%. Now I can just copy this down, one would say, and you'll see it didn't work. So why didn't it work? Let's investigate why it didn't work. So remember my table array I defined was cell B2 through D78. We talked about this prior, you know this already, I'm sure. When you copy a function or a formula, your cells adjust every time you copy it down or over to the right. In this case, we can see by the time I get down here, my cell, my table array is B31 through D107, which if I look over here, that's gonna be off my table. So what we didn't do is we did not anchor our table array. So we can come to our B2. You can either hit the F4 key, which will add your dollar signs, or you can put them in manually, that's fine. Okay, now, if we copy this down, okay, now we got what looks like valid data. We can spot check it over here and do a control home. So let's look at, I pull coffee is 8.55%. If I go to my margins tab and I look for that particular coffee, it's 8.55%. So we could spot check several of these if we wanted to. Now, something that's very important in a V lookup, which is a vertical lookup, or an H lookup, which is a horizontal lookup, your key field must be sorted in ascending order. Okay, so if I took this table and I did a sort, I have headers, and if I sort it by category, Right, maybe the data came to you this way. Well, I'm using product as a key field and you can see this is not in ascending or alphabetical order. So if I go back and look at my analysis, chances are this data is wrong. Okay, you have to have your key field to be in ascending order. It tells you even in the VLOOKUP, I'll show you that in a minute, let's undo that. So if I go back to my VLOOKUP, I go down to my range lookup. Closest match in the first column sorted in ascending order. So it's right there. So if you had some that weren't exact matches, you could put a one here and it'll find the closest match. But in this case, we're doing exact matches. So I've got my margins in. I wanna follow the same procedure. I'm gonna put my prices in, my selling price by unit. Create a new column. In this case, I can copy this formula. I'm gonna put it in my selling price, which is gonna give me the 16.91. However, what I want here is instead of, go back to margins. Remember, this is my table array right here. So instead of column two, in this case, I want column number three. That's why I highlighted all those columns. So if I put column number three in here, now I'll get my selling price, in which case for this product is $3.32. So now I wanna copy this formula down. All we did was change the column that I'm pulling back. Home, let's go ahead and click this column and let's format it as currency. If you hit the right thing, of course, would help. There we go, currency. 
convert it into US dollars, which I did prior. All right, so now I've got my margin and my selling price added. So let's go look at our other table of data. I've got damages. This is interesting. I got damage cost by quarter shown as a negative, which kind of makes sense in an accounting world, right? Now let's see what we got here. We have one entry for every quarter for every product. Hmm, this is gonna be a little more challenging. I can't, I can't use product for a match because I have more than one. I have four Alice Muttons here, right? With different values. So my V lookup cannot simply go by column B. There's no such thing as a V lookup in this version of Excel. I'm not gonna speak to Office 365 because Office 365 has added all kinds of exciting new functions that makes life easier. But in this version of Excel, which is Office 10, there is no function V lookup for multiple criteria. So the way you get around that is you think about what your key is gonna be. Your key means it's a unique value for each row. Well, I know meat, poultry, and Alice Mutton are not gonna be unique because I have duplicates. If I look at Alice Mutton and the quarter, I can see I have one record for each product for each quarter. So these two fields combined or these two columns combined are a key. I can use that as a match. So what I did was, I, let me get rid of this. I created a new column, right click and insert. I can call it key or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't really matter. What I want to do is I want to concatenate an old IBM term from back in the 70s in the mainframes. I want to basically take this value and add it, not mathematically add, but basically add this value to it, squish them together for lack of better way to describe this. So if I do an equals B2, the concatenation symbol in Excel is the and sign above the seven. And then I want C2, right? I'm gonna expand this column. It now took the value in column B and stuck the value in column C right behind it. So if I do this for all my rows, I will now have a unique key. Missed that one. I now have a unique key for every row. So for Alice Mutton, I've got quarter one, quarter two, quarter three, quarter four. For aniseed syrup, same. Same for Boston crab meat, you get the idea. I now have a unique key. So when I go back to my data, I now need a column for damages, damage costs rather. So now I wanna do a lookup again. So in this case, I wanna do a V lookup. Okay, what's my lookup value now? Well, my lookup value now has to be the value in column B and the value in column, column D, right? So what we're gonna do is the same thing we did on the other tab. In this case, we're gonna take B2 and concatenate it to D2. And that's my lookup value. You can use formulas and lookup values. And then I'm gonna use the same table array. I'm gonna go to margins. Oops, I'm sorry, damages, not margins. And in this case, I'm gonna use my table array right here. It's very important that when you define your table array, the value you're looking up has to be in the first column of your table array. I can't use the, all this starting in column A. The function automatically looks for your value in the first column of what you've defined. So in this case, I'm gonna use D2 through D287. And then, I'm going to say, what do I want to pull back? What column number? I want to pull back the second column of my array. And I'm going to do a false exact match, which is the default if you leave it off, by the way. All right. So I've got 7,068 and change. This is for quarter one. Quarter one. Let's go back to my top and do a spot check. Boop, boop, boop. 7068 dollars and some change so go back to my analysis let's go ahead and make this a currency uh, we'll make it the same for now we'll come back and revisit that 
All right, so now I can take this formula, copy it down. And when I'm done with this, haha, what did I do wrong? You should know by now. Did that anchor. All right, awesome. Quick spot check, I have included all of my data now on one tab. So to do a pivot table, I need all my data on one tab. So we've got all this lovely data here. Is that true? Category product sales. We get quarter margin, selling price, and damage costs. We've got our damage costs from here. All this is redundant. We have our margin and price. A and B is redundant. Yes. Okay. We got our data. So now if we work for this company, we need to think about what kind of questions would we have? What would be relevant? In any retail business, actually in any business whatsoever, if you don't know the numbers, your chances are you're going out of business, right? You got to know what's going on in your business in order to be successful. In order to ask some appropriate questions on here, we need to truly think about what data we have. We know we have the category. We know we got a product. We've got total sales by quarter. We've got a margin here. We've got a selling price. We've got a damage cost. All right, so if we have damage costs, we need to think about what other financial monetary type of data do we need? Seems to me we would wanna look at our total costs versus our net profit, would we not, by unit? So if we know our margin, and I don't want to turn this into an accounting class, much as I love accounting. If we know our margin, we should know our profit if we know total sales, right? Our profit, well, in this case, it's going to be an intermediate profit. Let's just call it profit for now. And we'll go to net profit in a minute. It's not really good accounting terminology. All right, I'll do it the other way. Let's just keep it whole. We should be able to calculate our costs. Keep my formatting consistent. All right, we've calculated our costs. Our costs, we're going to keep this very simple. Some of you true business majors or finance majors will say, no, nah, that's not right. Don't worry about that. We're going to say that our costs are basically um, one minus the margin, right? And we're going to attribute all that to cost. We're not going to get fixed costs, variable costs, and all that lovely stuff. Our margins are profit. We're making 16.91% every time we sell this product. So therefore, we make our margin is going to be 16.91% of 705,600 total sales. You know what? That's what we'll do. Late. It's been a long day. In this case, our margin in dollars, right? It's going to be very simply C2 times our margin, E2. All right. So on $705,000 worth of sales, we clear $119,000. Seems appropriate. All right, well, if we know what we're clearing, then the difference between our margin in dollars and our sales should be our costs, right? And with all the formulas you already know, we can say equals C2 minus H2. There we go, we got our costs for this product. All right, so we're almost done getting our data ready. Our next step will be to start analyzing it, answering some questions, solving some problems. And let's double click on the right end of this column to expand it. There we go. All right, so if we did everything correctly, I could take this number and this number, and I should at the bottom right 
you see 2.72 million. If I look over here, should equate to what we have in sales? And it does. So we've got a pretty good spot check. Let me spot check a couple of these. This is 12.8 million. That's correct. 4.4 million, 4.496 million. So there we go. We now have our margin dollars, our costs. We don't have profit yet because we have return damage costs that need to be factored in. Okay, those get added to our costs and come off our margin. So we could do a column for total costs. In this case, my damage costs came to me from the ERP system as a negative. However, I'm representing my costs as a positive right now because we're doing the math to subtract them from our sales. So in this case, I need to convert these to a positive number in order to add them, or I could just subtract a negative number, as you know from your algebra days. In our case, we just simply say equals I2. We could do it a couple of ways. I could say plus parenthesis G2 times negative one, right? That basically took whatever was in G2, multiplied it by negative one, which now makes it a positive. Add that to my I2. I have my total cost being the 586 plus the 7,000. All right, before I copy these, I'm just gonna go ahead and let's talk about our net profit now per item. Now we can say our net profit's going to be, we could do sales minus our total cost, right? Equals C2, you can do this so many ways. J2, all right, 112,000, which should equate to 119 plus the negative. You'll see down at the bottom, 112,256. That's exactly what we have. All right, so these are the types of data we need to start asking and answering some questions. All right, and this is fairly realistic. By the way, this is real data. I got this data from a source, I'll just say that. This could very well be an analyst problem that's been given to a, an entry level analyst, certainly. Here's all this data. Remember, we were given this source data, the margins and the damages, and the ask could be, let's start with a question. For this particular year, what category of product contributed the most to our sales? Great question. No way to tell looking at these 270 rows. No, I should, there's never, there's always a way. No easy way by looking at the data. So as we learned last time, pivot table is a wonderful way to look at data. Something new I'm gonna show you today, when you have data like this, it's always helpful to convert it to a table. When you convert to a table, when you add and delete columns, your pivot tables automatically update. You don't have to do a bunch of redefining. You just have to refresh and I'll show you what that means. So the way to do that is you're gonna highlight your data. In our case, we're gonna go ahead and highlight our data. I don't use this very often, so I'm gonna have to find it. Oh, this is in my way. Hold on, I gotta get this out of my way. Da, 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 da. Da, da. Okay, let's get out of the way. In your home tab, about middle of the ribbon, you'll see format as table. Click on that. And you got all these wonderful, colorful ways to look at your data, which none of those are, well, they might be important to you. They're not important to me. In this case, I'm just gonna pick this one, I suppose, looks good to me. Where's the data for your table? I already highlighted it. My table has headers, that's very important. So it knows that there's headers and voila, I now have a table. If I add a column, it's automatically included in my table. If I delete it, it's automatically deleted from my table, which is important when you do pivot tables. So now that I have this table, I'm gonna go ahead and insert a pivot table. From table and range, what's my table range? I didn't name my table actually. Should have probably. I'm gonna put it in a new worksheet. We covered this last time. All right, and you get your pivot table. Let me get these guys out of here. All right, there we go. 
All right, if you recall from last time, we now have our pivot table fields on the right, and we have our pivot table helper here, our report builder in the, on the left. All right, so we're asking about categories. So it seems like we wanna take our category, put it in our row column. We now know all our categories. The question we asked was, which category contributes the most to sales? Well, in that case, I need to know sales. So if I pull my sales down, in this case, I need it, doesn't make any sense to put here. That lists every sale for beverages for every quarter. That right? doesn't make any sense. So let's pick the sales up and put it over in values. All right, now I've got beverages. Let's go ahead and format that. Beverages consist of $101 million. Dairy products, we sell the most of dairy products, $111 million of dairy products. Very easy way to answer the question. Now say the question were, was by category, which for each category, what percentage of sales do they represent of total sales? Our total sales being just under $608 million. Okay, what you do here is we need to know a percentage of sales. So what we can do is we take our sales again, put it down in our values. We have the same thing. If you right click on the header here and go down to show values as, we can go to percent of parent row table and that converts. We'll probably wanna change this to say percent of sales. All right, so we know that beverages represent 16.73% of total sales. We still have the same answer. Dairy products represent 18.36%. But in addition, which we already knew here, is we don't have any one specific category that's blowing it out, right? Our sales are pretty consistent across the various categories. We have some high and low, but we don't have anything that's contributing more than 18% of sales. So we have a pretty good mix of products that are being sold. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? I have one. Go for it, Heather. Challenge Would me. <laughs> well, um, could you step back to and show that parent row thing one more time? Because you went really fast by that. And I think that was really important. So sorry. The percent of sales? Yeah, just, just to show how you do it from the parent row and the values yep. area. Thank you. You bet. All right. So whenever you want to add a percent, and I'll show you the options of what else you can add for a particular data value, you take the same data value and create a second column. So now I have two columns. You'll notice that Excel puts a two after the header. But now I wanna change that to be a percent of the total. So you go to the title of the column and right click on it. There's an option about two thirds the way down. It says show values as. I can show them as a percent of the grand total percent of the column total, and you can play with all of these. And there's different, there's all kinds of things. You could do running totals. You can rank them smallest to largest. For instance, let's see what that does. Base field is on category. Now, of course, this is, you have to change. We're not doing, I just changed it to currency and we don't want that to be. And I don't think I need that anymore. So now all I do is I did a rank reversed, right? Smallest is number one. That could be handy based on what the type of problem you have. But in our case, we wanted to show this as the percent of the parent row, which is the, the grand total, right? Or the parent row, I'm sorry, the parent row. In this case, we don't have any children row, so it's only gonna be the parent row. I'm gonna show that in a minute, Heather. I'll put the children in there and we'll, we'll go there. And then I change this to be percent of sales. All right, we had no children rows. I'll show you what a children row is. Let's look at, let's see here, where do I want to go from here? We know that we sell the most of dairy products. Now the question may come up because you're producing a report for senior leadership and you're analyzing sales. A good question might be, okay, well, we sell $111 million of dairy products. We know that we have that 
data amount, we'd have those data fields broken down by quarter. Huh. I wonder if we sell that evenly across four quarters or do we sell more in the winter, more in the summer? That's an easy answer. I've got the quarter data. If I grab my quarter data and drop it down into my rows, I now have, these are what are called children rows. The parent is beverages. The children are the quarters. I now know that I sell, if I look at beverages for the most part, 24%, 21%, 18. I'm pretty consistent. I sell a little more in the quarter four, right? Which would correspond to the first half of winter. If I look at my condiments, pretty even across. Confections, I'm higher in the fourth quarter. Gosh, I wonder why. Mm, well, Finland probably celebrates Christmas, right? Everybody's pumping out the confections at Christmas. Dairy products, quarter three is a little higher than quarter four. That's kind of interesting. I guess people are so busy eating confections, they're not drinking any dairy products. Grains and cereals, pretty consistent, no pattern. Meat and poultry, there's a spike in quarter three. Produce, produce is kind of bizarre. It's interesting. 28% in quarter one, 36% in quarter three. That's interesting. Seafood bunched up in the middle of the year. Apparently in quarter four, people don't eat a lot of seafood. At least they're not buying it from us, right? So what type of questions can this analysis answer is basically looking at, if we're looking at a marketing campaign, let's first look at where do we focus our marketing campaign? If I look at just categories, I could say, well, we want to sell more produce, assuming that Produce is a good way to invest, right? Well, if I want to sell more produce, when do I do a marketing campaign? Well, seems like I shouldn't spend a lot of money marketing produce in quarter three, should I? I've already got 36% of my sales are coming in quarter three. If I had a limited amount of funding and I said, okay, I want to heavily target produce, whether it be through a coupon engagement, whether it be TV commercials, whether it be billboards, you've seen all the Kroger junk out there and how they try to reach you with Kroger and Publix and all those. When do I want people to buy produce? Quarter two. If I had a limited amount of money and I can't put billboards up for 12 months because that's expensive, I'd probably want to focus my money in quarter two and see if I can't boost my produce sales, right? Can I ask another question before we ask that question though? Oh, well, I've already asked that question. So it'll have to be after I ask that question. <laughs> Go ahead. When we want to know what's making us money before we spend money on it. I mean, if produce isn't making us money, why? Awesome. Money? So you're just stealing my whole show, Heather. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's perfect. That's great. Please. All, all students, attendees do that. That's exactly where I was going next. That is wonderful. We really can't make those judgments just based on when we are selling our product. The question is, are we making any money? All right, good deal. Let's do this. Let's take quarter out for now. So we want to know, this stuff's in the way. A couple of ways we can go about this. We could look at our margin dollars. We could just look at our net profit, right? But that might be not tell us what we want. We could put our net profit in here. Didn't want to put it there. I'll put it there, right? So net profit, beverages on $101, $101.7 million, our profit's gonna be 19.2 million, right? 55 to 11, 83 to 12, you get the idea. Now we could figure out what percentage our net profit is of sales, right? which should be close to the margin, correct? <laughs> However, since we have net profit, it's gonna be a little different because we have factored in our return costs and our damage costs. So it's not gonna be exactly the margin that we had given to us in our data. So we could do a couple things. I could just do a formula here, but remember it will not be included in the pivot table, or we can go back and look at what data we have. So in this case, we have a margin percentage Matter of fact, let me move this. Let's go back to our analysis data. Do we have anything we can use here that would give us net profit divided by our total sales? I don't see anything. We have our margin before we 
remove damage cost, damage slash return cost. I didn't put that in there. So we actually need to have another column here. So let's add a column and let's call it, um, I guess we'd call it final profit margin. I don't know, I'm not too creative. Counting speak, it would be your net profit margin really. Right. In true accounting, we would fat, we would account for these damage costs differently. I'm doing it rather simple. So in this case, if we took our net profits L2 and we divided that by our total sales of C2. And again, it defaulted to currency because that's what I've been using the most. Excel tries to learn from you and it doesn't always do so very well. All right. Well, let's make those percentages. Format cells, percentage. All right, so we got some profits, right? Profit margins by quarter. All right, so now we've got some data. Let's again move this. Where did I have that? I think it's here. All right, so now we gotta refresh our data because it's not here. The new column I added. So if I go to pivot table, analyze, in the middle of your ribbon, there's a refresh. Should be able to, I had problems, there we go. You always have to refresh your data if you change your table, right? So now when I hit refresh for the pivot, you'll see my net profit margin is there. So let's go ahead and add my net profit margin over here. That doesn't look right, does it? First of all, let's make it a number, a percentage. It's gonna be goofy. That cannot be right. You should immediately know, no, that's not right. You'll see at the top, it says count, right? We don't want count, do we? Do we want some? Probably not, right? So remember from our pivot table discussion, we go down to the value section of our pivot table. We go to the field in question. We hit our drop down arrow, value field settings. we got some options. Okay, some count, max, bin, none of that's gonna work for us. If we do an average, it'll work, right? With the exception of our seafood, let's go back because we have a problem with seafood. What's our problem with seafood? Somewhere in here, there's a zero. Here we go. In quarter four, nobody bought any of this stuff. Just out of curiosity. All I got out of this is some type of fish, right? <laughs> Nobody bought any of this right here, rightly so it would appear in my taste anyway, but so we got a zero here and that's messing up our, our values. So we can do a couple things. We could put a zero right there. Whoops, go here. We're gonna have a problem with this regardless because of seafood. So in that particular case, what do we have to do? We talked about this last session. If we're doing this type of analysis, we would need to drop that quarter, right? Because there's no data. In this analysis, I would drop this, this record. It's not providing me any value whatsoever. That's why we keep our data somewhere else because we just deleted something and now it's gone forever. If we do another analysis, that record may be valuable. All right, so now let's go back here. Let's go back to our pivot table. Let's refresh our data. Let's see what that did. There we go. So we got rid of our invalid data, which was a zero. All right, so to Heather's question now, produce has an average profit margin of 21%. That might be a good place to spend some, spend some bucks, right? However, this is kind of misleading because these don't add up to 100, they add up to 150. So we gotta really look at this a different way, don't we? So let's do this. Let's get rid of that, that's no fun. Let's go back and put our quarter back. Let's take our margin percentage. 
not the sum though. We'll take the average. Let's convert that to what it needs to be. Okay, if we go back to the, the pure data, if you remember, I only had one row per product within category, right? So this quarter one would be the average margin for all the products sold in quarter one that are beverages, right? And this would be quarter two and quarter three and quarter four of the total. So that means quarter one here, quarter one there, does this make sense to you? So in that case, we would still, produce still comes out with some justification for spending some money there from a marketing campaign. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. What else can we look at? What other kind of questions can we do? Let's talk about this table. If you work at this company, certainly if you're an executive at this company, you've got some questions here, right? Every company is going to have some sort of damage cost, whatever they refer to it as, right? It's going to be, I don't want to say hidden, it's going to be included in return goods. If you're retail, there's a return good cost. Um, all those folks that go out there to Kohl's and they buy 17 things and they go back tomorrow and return 16 of them, right? Kohl's recognize profit on 17 items, well, 16 of those come back and they've been refunded. That's gotta come out somewhere. You can't recognize that as income, otherwise you end up in a, oh, I don't know, Enron, WorldCom type situation um, where you're falsely reporting profits. Um, this Especially one's Especially with food because you can't sell it again after you've sold it once. It goes into spoilage cost, right? Right, it's waste. It's waste, unless it's a product you can put back on the shelf. I have a great example. I don't usually do the grocery shopping in my particular household, but I did last Friday. And I went and bought a bunch of junk because I just get a list. You know, I'm just a, I'm just a, I'm a staff member doing the work. I don't question it. I just buy the list. And I go through it all and I get it home. My wife looks at it and says, well, and you know, Kroger's got these stupid buy five, save 50 cents or whatever that is. It drives me up a wall. My wife's looking at the receipt and saying, well, these didn't ring up right. I said, okay, great. No, these didn't ring up right. You need to go back. I said, what? I need to go back. Are you serious? So she repacks a bag of like eight different things. I take it back to customer service. And I go to the girl there that's manning the desk. And she said, what do you need? I said, I'm returning this stuff. She said, why? And I said, your computer's wrong. It's not priced right. So she's looking at it and she said, well, you didn't buy five of these. And we go through the whole thing. I mean, they're, I've invested 20 minutes of my life now to prove to her that I did buy five things. And at this point, she said, well, do you want the money back? She just want to return it. Well, I took money back and there were two things that were just rung up wrong. There, I said, I want to return those. Well, you know, they put them right back on the shelf because they weren't spoilable, spoilage. So you have a mix in, in food. It's either waste or it's going to be returned good still. And some poor sucker is going to come by and buy it tomorrow at the wrong price. Unless they fix their computer. <laughs> All right, a little entertainment for you. So this is a concern. This is a concern. That's, you're always gonna have some, right? Um, in this case, we're not necessarily a retailer, we're a wholesaler. So say we're selling to retailers. So I don't know, somebody drove a skid of Alice mutton right off the cliff, who knows, right? <laughs> We've lost this amount of money. We want to look at, we want to start analyzing that money. Let's go back to our pivot table, which would be over here. Let's look at by category, by quarter. What's our losses here? That's easy. We take our damage costs right here. Boom. In this case, this could be represented as a negative. That's okay. We'll deal with that later. But at the end of the day, here's my damage costs per quarter. For beverages, condiments, down here, I've got $12 million of damage costs out of $608 million of sales. Quick calculation would say, if I did E44 divided by B44,
less than 2% damage cost. That's actually probably not too bad. <laughs> it looks bad, probably not on $608 million of sales. Although certainly somewhere that might be worth a focus, right? So we can look by quarter by category. We don't see anything. Don't see anything. Um, perhaps we want to do something such as, and this gets a little ugly, but it's worthwhile. What if we look at our product now? All right, so we're gonna get all kinds of stuff now. So our beverages by quarter one. $300,000 right here, but that's on $12.8 million of sales, right? So it's going to be somewhat skewed based on if you're moving more product, you're going to have more damage, one would think. So really the question becomes, what's the percentage? Is the percentage consistent or not? Do we have somewhere where the percentage of damage costs are concerning? So let's, this is a little too much to take in right now. So let's do this. Let's get rid of my quarter information. Let's just look by product, all right? So now we got all our products. We can see some, they correspond again, costs are higher, damage costs are higher when sales are higher, somewhat. In this case, it's not. So we probably wanna look at the percent. Now that could be done right here by just saying E2 divided by B2, whoops. I don't know where I got two from, that's a five. Oh. All right, let's just change that real quick to be a percentage again, um, to make it truly multiply by negative one. Let's pull this down. Well, let's just do here and then let's do here. Whoops. Here, you get the idea. Let's just analyze the first one. So if I'm looking at this as an analyst, I'm thinking mm, we have pretty consistent damage across the board. I don't see one jumping out at me that says, hey, we got a problem. Somebody's continually damaging this particular product, right? The highest one we got here is about 2.58%. If I continue the analysis down, all consistent. Perhaps we could say, well, let's look everywhere where there's more than two and a half percent and do a lean Six Sigma project for those of you in supply chain to determine what are the root causes for the damage and return goods in these categories. We could start with, this might be interesting, Across the board, however, by product category, there's no difference. There's no statistical significant difference here. So you'd have to look by product and see if you wanted to attack the 2.5s, the, I think I saw a 2.7 in here, 2.7, right? You could take all these column here. Whoops, way too far. You could do a conditional format on these. If you remember that, let's add a rule. All right, we want to use a formula to determine which cells to format. Now we could do based on our value, couldn't we? No, we don't want to do that. That's going to be ugly. Let's do this. Greater than, remember these are percentages, 0 0.025, right? I want to format them in a lovely color. One, two, three, four, yellow. Okay. Apply. Okay. Whoops, what did I do wrong? We don't have any. <laughs> let's change it to be, let's just say 0.02.
Okay, now why is that not working? Is this right here? All right, so if we do this and we say lowest, well, that's just gonna do that. That's kind of cool, right? But the conditional format, and we covered this last week, manage rules, let's find out what's wrong with this rule. Low average, only cells that contain, this should be, it's greater than, greater than 0.02. All righty. I don't know what I'm doing wrong with those. That seems pretty simple to me. How bizarre. Well, I'll come back to that in a minute. I need to figure that out. I'll come back to that in a minute. Though. I don't want to waste my time on that. All right, so we now have an understanding of our damage costs, our damage return costs. Possibly where we can look, we can make a statement to this corporate executive to say, our damage costs don't appear to be, well, you can't say they're not statistically significant because you'd have to run a statistical test to show that, right? You'd have to look at whether these values are statistically different from the mean value, right? The mean value for beverages, 1.95. The question then becomes statistically is 1.47 statistically different than 1.95? Is it statistically significant? Right? So we would run a statistical test to determine that. You remember this from your stats days. You would set up your null hypothesis. You would set up your alternative hypothesis. You would run the test, whether it be a t test or um, a z test. You would determine based on your alpha, which is your type one error risk, and you would come to the statistical conclusion that most likely, no, these are not statistically different. There's no reason to invest money if we have limited set of resources in figuring out the sum of damage costs. Now, perhaps your CEO comes back and says, hey, look, 12 million is too much. I don't care what you're telling me over here. You're telling me it's a low percentage. That's great, but it's $12 million. That's $12 million is coming out of profit, right? If I saved that $12 million, where would that go? It would go directly to the net profit, would it not? These are lost costs. You'll never get it to zero, but perhaps we can get it to zero. Uh, sorry, we can get it lower than 12 million. Therefore, a Lean Six Sigma project would be engaged to determine what are the root causes for these damage costs. And we would look to reduce those causes to reduce the net effect, which in this case is a negative cost. But that's beyond Excel, I suppose. All right, so we've answered some questions here. Let's get rid of all this. Let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that. Let's go back to our sales. Let's get rid of all this stuff. Let's get rid of that column. There we go. We're back to our percentage of sales. What else could we look at? We don't know how many units we sell of all these. We do know their margin, right? I don't know if units would be very useful here. Let me stop here while I'm thinking about another question. We've only got 15 minutes left. Who has a question? This has all been terribly easy for you, right? You've done this before in your classes. This is all just, Professor Tarpy, this is just repeat. I'm falling asleep. Is anybody out there besides Heather? No, I'm awesome. here. Hey, Michael, thank you much. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to figure out how to respond to all that. So this is <laughs> way above my head. I'm, 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 I'm excited about all the different things you can do. I was like, I'm hoping he's not expecting me to keep up on this spreadsheet that he sent me no. and do all this stuff. Because <laughs> no. uh, you left me a long time ago. No, and I, I, I certainly don't expect that. I'll get to you, Heather, in just a second. Thanks. Um, as we talked about in our first session, if you were with us, we talked about, <laughs> thank you everybody that said, yes, I'm here in the chat. Um, uh, Luke came out and talked about Excel's used every day in business. If you go into a particular job, certainly if you're a supply chain analyst, you would be given this data and would be expected to come back with your summary of what this data is telling you. 
right? You would get some guidance. Perhaps you're looking at focusing on damage return costs. Perhaps you're focusing on percent of sales to determine where would a marketing campaign make sense. Um, products for potential elimination, right? In this case, if we looked at product lines that we would want to eliminate, we would look at a couple things. Well, what's our lowest selling product? Well, here we go. Our lumberjack laggers, not selling much in the beverage category, right? So the question then becomes what Heather indicated earlier. Well, we're only selling 2% of total. It only makes up 2% of beverage sales, but are we making money on it? If we're not making money on it, okay, we've got a potential here that we might want, might want to eliminate this particular product line. Guys, Walmart does this every week. If you're not selling, you're gone, right? Kroger does too. If you're not selling, they're not going to dedicate valuable shelf space to your product. They're going to get rid of this shelf space and put some lagger in here that's truly selling because people want more of it. Why waste time with this one? Your risk is 1.87% 1 of sales. You're going to have four unhappy customers. Who cares? They can go somewhere else and buy their lumberjack lager, right? Unless I'm making good money on it. Heather, what was your question? Actually, I had two call outs that made some of this easier for me. Um, what, I, I didn't want to cut you off way earlier, but as long as you're clicking your data, if you just hold control and press T, it'll create your table for you. Oh yeah, shortcuts, love them. Uh, the other thing is something that helps me because of my dyslexia and just getting lost is named ranges are very important mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. <clears throat> so I don't know if that would help other people. Um, the other thing too is the format values where this formula is true. I'm not sure if you used an equal sign before you did your greater than. Oh, you know what? That's what it was. See, when you're talking, you don't think. <laughs> that goes just, back. <laughs> I was just trying to figure out what was wrong because I was like, wait a minute, that should be that should be right. <laughs> yeah, that so. goes back to my um, my general rule number one, which is human beings cannot do two things at once. There is no such thing as multitasking. It's in this, but it does say use a formula and it's not a formula unless you have an equal sign, correct? Correct. So if I had equals, see, but I thought if you put equals point or just put greater than 0.02, it converted it. Apparently it doesn't or it's converting it incorrectly. So let's see what it does. See, it says equals greater than 0.02, right? So it put the equal sign in there for me, but it's not happening. So I would expect, and here's a great way. This is what you'll spend most of your life doing if you're an analyst. There's no point on messing around with it for very long. Conditional formatting, you can say greater than or equal to. Most of them are right. Sometimes you get some bogus answers. You could do a highlight cells with a greater than. There's, it'll tell you how to do it. I'm looking for what the actual line's gonna be. Is it gonna tell me? Is it gonna tell me? Is it gonna tell me? This one's not gonna tell me. Let's go back to another one. Go to our famous friendly Google. Always be aware, as many times you get bogus answers in Google, not so much with Excel. Okay, that's then another cell. So how about a value? Oh, that's how they get around it. I don't want that though. Let's do this equal to a value. That's important. Value, here we go. So what are we doing wrong here? What am I doing wrong here? Yeah, 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 yeah. I like it, I like it, I like it. Cell value. Only sells, oh, that's the easier way to do it. Sell values that contain, let's delete this rule, it's bogus. New rule, only that contain a sell value. This is the easier way to do it. Greater than, in our case, let's do, I don't know, 5%. That's the way I usually did it, but it's- Yeah, this is a my much, much easier yeah. way, there we go. I just didn't know what, what the heck you were doing wrong. And I was like, wait a minute, that logically that makes sense. 
but I, that should have worked. I got to go back and look at that in my free time because <laughs> it should have worked. <laughs> All right, so conditional formatting can be very important if you're showing this data to somebody. So, okay, here's what we would focus on because it's over 5% of sales. In our case, probably the better answer would be, let's go back to our rules, click our rule and edit. In reality, we would be more concerned if we're looking at product elimination of less than 5%, right? Matter of fact, let's make it less than, I need less than 4% would be considered for eliminating unless it's making decent money, which we would want to add our margin back in and our profits. So with one set of data across multiple tables, you can do a lot of analysis to actually answer questions about the state of the business for this particular year. You can look at eliminating products. You can look at marketing campaigns. If you want to boost products, sales of different products, you can look at um, damaged costs, return costs, um, you can look at overall costs if you feel your costs for a particular product are too high, right? In this case, it wasn't for us. Let's see what we had here. I don't think we did that analysis. Let's do that real quick because that's easy. If we just look at total costs, well, I don't want to look at my damage costs. I want to look at total costs before damage. So it's basically the inverse of your profit or your margin, right? So on $29 million of sales, I have 22 million of costs. Here's where Walmart would look at that and say, well, that's not effective for me. If you're selling me this particular product, I want you to lower the price to me, right? In which case we're back to margins to say, I want my margin to be, let's put our margin back in, our margin percentage back in. And we want that not to be a sum. We want that be to an average. Let's format that as a percentage. And Walmart is really the first retailer that did this with any volume whatsoever and said, um, well, in this case, probably not. It'd be down here. I'm only making 8.9% margin here. You need to lower your cost to me so I can make more margin. That's what Walmart says, right? And you come back and say, well, no, I'm not going to. I can't do that. And then Walmart says, okay, well, in this case, I can't do it here. Bummer. <laughs> it's a pivot table. Okay, well, we're not selling Outback Lager anymore. Don't send us anymore. We'll sell out what we have. We'll mark it all down as a closeout, and it's gone. Um, and you can read stories about the 70s and 80s, of um, mostly the 80s and 90s, where Walmart just browbeat suppliers into low prices, which is how they were able to sell for lower, plus a markup, so to speak. Great story. Isn't, isn't that how big lots got their stick? Because wouldn't they buy all the lots that they didn't want to sell? Mm -hmm. And then big lots, and there's another one that does that. Ollie's, whether they be closeouts or they fell off a truck, and since they fell off a truck, Walmart won't accept them. Um, it's all returns. A lot of it's returns. Walmart gets a bunch of returns. They don't want to restock them. They ship them off to a, a discounter like that. That's how Ollie's and Big Lots can afford to sell that stuff the price they do. Um, yeah, always be cautious when you buy food from those places. Check the expiration dates. Chances are it was sitting on a truck for a while. <laughs> I looked at one. We love my wife and I like to go in there every now and then just for fun. I picked up a box of cereal that was dated last year. <laughs> so, wow, <laughs> it's cheaper, but it might be a little soft. <laughs> all right so the intent here was to illustrate what you can do with excel i know we went through this very fast hopefully those of you that have attended the first three sessions picked up a lot of what we did we covered most of this before it was just now actually doing it and manipulating the data in different fashions now one thing i do want to show you before we leave because this is very useful if i go back to my data i've got this in a table this is recent. I think it's with Excel 10. It might be earlier. I guess I don't really know. I'd have to research this. They've got a button up here that says analyze data. You know, everybody wants to put their own artificial intelligence and things, right? Microsoft, not wanting to be behind the time, said, well, we want to make life easier for the entire world and make the world better. So we're going to add an analyze data tab here or an option. If you click that, it's going to think for a minute. Microsoft Excel 
is going to suggest to you what you should analyze in your data based on your category headers and the type of data you have. Isn't that wonderful? Most of it makes no sense, but that's cool. It's a good start at life. You can ask a question here. I haven't done that, but it's already suggesting that we look at sales by category and quarter. Well, yeah, we already did that. Great idea. Um, frequency of net profit margin. That makes no sense to me. What's it, what is it? Let's take a look at it. So basically it's given me a distorted histogram of how many times my margin of products based on number of products falls into this category. Well, that actually has no value whatsoever. Costs and net profit appear to form a cluster with an outlier. Damage costs and net profit are correlated. Well, that kind of makes a little sense, doesn't it? Let's take a look at that. All right, well, that kind of makes a little sense. Now, since they're negative numbers, we have a reverse correlation, not a reverse correlation, but we have a negative correlation, right? If these were positive, I'd have a positive correlation going from left to right up. In this case, it's a negative correlation, but that kind of makes sense. The higher the damage cost, the lower my net profit. So we haven't come across any Nobel Prize winning information here. <laughs> and that's all they suggest. It can be a very useful tool. Well, I take that back. There's 32 results. Heaven help us. Um, they're kind of fun to play with. Total cost appears highly determined by selling price. Well, interesting. That doesn't make any statistical sense. But you would expect selling price is related to total cost because I'm always going to set my price at a price that's higher than total cost, right? So that kind of makes sense. Costs and total costs appear highly correlated. Okay. <laughs> Again, shouldn't be too surprising. Sales and margin percent appear to form, whoa, what happened there? Appear to form a cluster with an outlier. Well, my costs and margin dollars should be directly related, should they not? So this would not be too surprising. The outlier might be surprising if we can figure out who it is. 5.7 million and the 19. The problem is you'd have to go through here and find out what that is. So we don't have time to do that. But the point of this is Excel will suggest some ways to analyze your data. Frequency of damage costs. Really what I would need to do is frequency of damage costs by product, not by whatever these are, right? So you'd have to usually change these somehow to make them valid into some sort of analysis. But they could be good starting points for you to work with. For instance, you could take this particular graph and modify the graph to have it by product category, which would make sense. That's something that could go into an executive summary, certainly. So apparently there were 38 of these that you could look at. And then I believe I showed you last week, I don't know if we talked about this, I'm gonna go into this next semester, the data analysis, as far as how you can run descriptive statistics, and statistical testing within Excel. But that is beyond the scope of our current session. All right, I don't wanna start any more new topics. I got through what I wanted to get through, which is wonderful and usually quite unusual for me to actually hit everything. Would Who has a question? Would yeah. you be comfortable sending us this just so we can, if, if some of us missed a couple of the steps, specifically like the concatenation and everything, just your syntax that you used in case we wanted to go through it later. This updated version of the data set? Yes. Sure, yeah, I'll send that out. Thank you. You bet. Yeah, all this is real data. The prices are not necessarily, the selling prices are not necessarily real data. They're close. I didn't want to get too, uh, um, I didn't want to get in trouble. <laughs> So I made some modifications to the selling price. All right, who has a question, a comment, a happy thoughts? Something related. What company was this? Oh shoot, that's a great question. 
Um, I don't recall. Well, let me rephrase. I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> I can send that out as well. It was, it's public data, actually. That's a great question. Um, as you can tell, it was not a US company. It was not a domestic company. That's a given, right? Company, data set. Who else has a question? Hopefully you found this of some value and hopefully you listened to doing it and didn't turn your computer on and go watch TV so you can get the extra credit, which is one thing I don't like about Zoom session Ignite events. But regardless, next semester, I hope to start doing these in person where we'll actually go in a computer lab and actually take this step by step and you'll, I'll have you do it and we'll answer these questions with a new data set. I've got a new data set on COVID-19, gotta love it. Number of ICU beds near and dear to my heart being healthcare for 22 years, um, ICU bed capacity versus staffing levels, which you heard about a lot during 2021. Can't open any more ICU beds because I've got no nurses left. How to forecast how many nurses we would need to open so many beds. That's a great problem to study. Um, not to mention, I've got Tennessee data from uh, ICU, um, um, intubation, and deaths. Very interesting data from COVID-19. And I got some other data sets too, because we've had enough COVID-19 in our lives. All right, well, now I'm just kind of stretching this out for that final minute. So if nobody has any remaining questions, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'll be happy to answer your questions or whatever the case may be or assist you in any way that I may. Otherwise, have a wonderful night. Thank you much. What's left of it? Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You're most welcome, Katie. Thank you. Jorge, how you doing, buddy? Do you stay with me on that? You're on mute. You're on mute. Oh, yeah. There we go.